Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Laura Catena. I am a fourth generation vendor and a physician. I did my undergrad in biology at Harvard and my medical school at Stanford, and then specialized in emergency medicine and practiced as an emergency physician for 25 years plus. And I'm here to talk to you guys about Widen Health which is a somewhat uh, controversial topic these days, but I think that there is a path that is based on science and uh, that makes me think that I should continue drinking wine a few days per week, despite some of these recommendations, especially from the WHO. And today I'm gonna to tell you a bit about some of the, the data, the studies that have been done concerning wine and health and uh, some of the, uh, the statements that WHO is making that I think are actually uh, somewhat not based on science. So let me get here the click. Okay, so what's at stake? There uh, was an article in the New York Times, there's been several articles uh, saying that uh, even a little alcohol can harm your health. Um, and, uh, you know, this is in the New York Times, January, 2023. It really concerns people like me who uh, make wine, who've been making wine for 122 years, my family in Argentina. This is a 10,000 year old beverage that has been consumed by people. A lot of us enjoy drinking wine. It's very concerning to see something like this in the New York Times. And I think it's really important uh, to do what I write here. And I'm, I'm gonna go through some of these concepts in more detail, but wine is not tobacco because there are some studies that show some potential benefits with uh, limited drinking. We need to also teach people how to drink because a lot of people, regardless of what the health benefits or negatives are, will continue drinking. So we need to talk a lot about uh, moderation and limited drinking. We need to have mandatory training for people in the industry. And we need to acknowledge that prohibition has been tried and it didn't work. So that is should not be the path. And we need to define what is moderation. And we need to talk about the Mediterranean diet and all uh, the moderation literature that exists around wine, especially, and, which has been consumed for over 10,000 years. That's a long time. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about wine. It's a cultural drink. It's been around for 10,000 years. It's part of the Mediterranean diet, which has been shown to uh, reduce the risk of cardiovascular events, reduce the risk of cancer, it's been shown to be a very healthy diet and which includes limited drinking of wine in uh, moderation. And it's part of a civilized way of life. There's today a loneliness epidemic. We have found that socializing is very good for your mental health, for your overall health and wine in moderation can help us have a really good time with friends and family. But again, the key is this word moderation, right? So, this is a quote that I really like, uh, Thomas Jefferson, wine brightens the life and thinking of anyone. I believe this is what wine does for me. And what I wanna talk about is these three topics. So uh, review some of the data on beneficial cardiovascular effects from limited alcohol consumption seen in population studies. I wanna talk about the real risks of certain cancers with mostly heavy drinking, but some of them can be uh, correlated with some slight increases with uh, limited drinking, and then define what is moderate drinking. You know, is it a huge glass that's like half a bottle? Well, no, that's too much. And I wanna talk a little bit about that. Okay, so one of the big problems we have is that there are no long-term randomized controlled studies for alcohol, which is, you know, you give one person a, a small drink and another person a placebo. That's what happens with all medications that get approved and nobody's been able to do that study. Actually, somebody attempted to do it, but it was canceled because of uh, negative press and that kind of thing, which was a bummer because it would have been a great study uh, to see what the real effects are. And the guidelines based on a lot of these, uh, you know, randomized um, studies, uh, metadata analyses, um, a lot of studies that have been done that are mostly observational because, as I said before, there is not a randomized control study done, have shown that at one glass per day for women and two glasses per day for men, the benefits of limited drinking can I weigh, outweigh the, benefit, the negatives. So, you know, here's what the measurements mean. You know, wine, we talk about five ounces 
12% alcohol. That's what one glass is. And, you know, some people think that's a lot. Some people think that that's a little, it doesn't matter. That's what's potentially helpful. If you drink a lot more than that, it's too much. And, and men can potentially drink a little more than women because of having more alcohol dehydrogenase and because of uh, a sort of weight situation and uh, more muscle. Okay, so what are some of these uh, studies shown? They have uh, shown observed 10 to 30% reduction in heart attacks, embolic stroke, sudden cardiac death, uh, and peripheral vascular disease. And, you know, there's hundreds of studies and their prospective studies, they're well done, they're, uh, you know, blinded. Uh, these are not, uh, you know, beginner studies. They, they're using these big databases like the Fred Mayhem database and other big databases all over the world. In Europe, in Asia, they've been done in North and South America, and they pretty much show the same thing. So what is the mechanism? for the cardioprotective effects, raised HDL, which is the good cholesterol. This is also found in studies of people who drink in uh, limited fashion. And also alcohol has a fibrinolytic effect. This has been showed in the lab very clearly, such as an aspirin that would act as a preventing Blake uh, formation. And you know, it's always nice to know what is the mechanism be behind something that we see in the data. And there is you know, a pretty strong mechanism going on here for uh, light to moderate alcohol. Wine prepares the heart for love unless you take too much. I also like that phrase because definitely drinking too much is not good for your heart, for your brain. You know, it can also lead to, you know, greater memory loss, dementia, hemorrhagic stroke, hypertension, heart attacks, abnormal heart rhythms. And you know, honestly, more than four drinks per day is already too much, but this is where you see, you know, a lot of the really bad stuff increasing dramatically, uh, but really you should stick to the recommendations that I mentioned before. So, you know, this is important stuff. You know, it's a subtle message. You can drink in moderation. If you can't, you know, limit your drinking, you should probably stop drinking. In fact, you should stop drinking if you care about your health. So why are some academics questioning the cardiovascular benefits data is because the um, data is observational. You know, they're looking at uh, people who have uh, filled out surveys and then they do control and, you know, non-control group. They try to make the group similar. One drinks, one doesn't drink, and they reach conclusions. So again, a randomized control study where you actually pick the patients and then, you know, give them, you know, alcohol or no alcohol, placebo has not been done. Um, and so some people claim that, um, you know, these are not good studies, but a lot of things are decided based on these studies. In fact, all the cancer data, you know, about uh, alcohol potentially increasing some cancers is based on this same data because nobody's ever done a randomized controlled study. And there's also a claim that some of the non-drinkers in, in the control groups are actually ex-heavy uh, drinkers. And, and that is a, a good criticism. However, these studies have been looked at again, and many of the studies uh, allowed the researchers to separate the non-drinkers. And even when you separate the non-drinkers who are ex-heavy drinkers, you still see these cardiovascular benefits. So, uh, you know, that, that is actually not a good argument. So uh, this is a photo of my uh, son with his grandfather. What is a person to do? So. A 22 year old who, you know, is trying to decide, you know, should I drink, uh, you know, should I, I don't know, use cannabis or something else? Um, you know, it's, it's a difficult question because actually for that 22 year old, if they happen to have a history of alcoholism in their family or they're, you know, a bit of a risk taker, um, they uh, could actually start drinking too much. Uh, they could drunk drive, they could, you know, take some of these risks. They're a young person. Uh, there is no cardiovascular benefit for a 22-year-old from drinking alcohol. So I think for a 22-year-old, really, there is no potential benefit. And if, if they're you know, drinking, it's because it's part of their culture, their Mediterranean diet. You know, I'm from Argentina. You know, young people usually drink with their parents and, and a family meal. Um, occasionally, they drink good wine, um, and it, it brings the family together. 
Uh, but you can you should not say, okay, a 22 year old will benefit from drinking. Now, once you talk about a 60 year old man who has a high cardiovascular risk uh, factors uh, for him, uh, then, then there's a, a definite potential benefit because you have these benefits from the limited uh, drinking. Now, if this person might um, drink too much or has had a history of drinking too much or binge drinking, then it would probably be best, uh, it would be best to not drink. Uh, so, you know, it really depends on the age when you can say there might be a, a potential uh, health benefit and when uh, there is no potential health benefit and you have to make your decision uh, based on some of your risk factors and how much you enjoy it and how much you're able to drink in moderation. So let's look, look at the breast cancer risk. Uh, so breast cancer is a common cancer and the estimated incre increase in risk of breast cancer is about 1.1 uh, for one drink daily, which is, you know, what the recommendations are, that one drink daily is okay. Yet there is this 1.1, um, so that would be a 10% increase. So what that means is that your lifetime risk goes from, let's say your risk is 10%, it goes to 11%. Let's say your risk was 15%, it goes to 16.5%. So if you have a very strong family history of breast cancer, you know, then you might really want to think about your drinking. And the more you drink, the more the risk increases. So let's say that you really love having a cocktail here and there. Um, well, maybe just limit your drinking. Anything you do to reduce uh, the alcohol drinking would help you with this risk. Now, many studies will, will uh, state, oh, there's a 10% increase in risk. And it's important to, to know that it doesn't mean at net 10%, it's a 10% on the um, risk you already have. So... For a 60-year-old woman, 10 times more women die each year in the U.S. from heart disease, 460,000 approximately, than from breast cancer, 41,000. So if you are a 60-year-old woman, again, uh, the cardiovascular risk is so much higher, and there's uh, you know, a 10 to 20 to 30 percent uh, reduction. That's It depends on the study, and there's only this 10 percent increase in your breast cancer risk, so you know probably the odds are still in benefit of limited drinking. However, many people are more afraid of breast cancer than of cardiovascular disease. And, you know, that's the decision for each person to make. So cancer, what are the risks? Um, so with heavy consumption, there is definitely a risk in many of these studies, uh, which are flawed studies, but the, but the risk is there. You know, again, it's the same data that's used for the cardiovascular uh, potential benefits. We're seeing increase in cancers, which makes sense. If you think of the the mouth, the throat, you know, in high doses, alcohol is a carcinogen. And um, so, yeah, the mouth, throat, that's where the alcohol goes through. Uh, the liver, it's where the alcohol is metabolized. So it would make sense that um, you would see increase in liver cancers. Like, for example, with hepatitis, you see increases in liver cancer because it's, it's the liver that's being affected. Uh, the uh, colorectal cancer, again, with, with high uh, consumption. But you can see even some slight increases in, in oral esophageal cancers from limited drinking. Now, they've also found in these studies some decreases in some cancers like lung cancers, kidney cancers, some hematologic malignancies, which, you know, I don't think there's a clear explanation. But again, that's what some of the data shows. So let's look at the cancer risk, genetic versus the environment. Um, genetic risk is 5 to 10%. That surprised me. I thought it was a lot bigger. Environment, 90 to 95%. And we see here that, um, you know, tobacco is 25 to 30%. Alcohol, 4 to 6%, a lot smaller. Um, diet is really big, but it, it's not that easy for people to change their diet. Obesity, it's not that easy to lose weight. Infections, there's nothing we can do about it. So, you know, I kind of feel like there's probably some special interests out there that are going after alcohol because it's the only thing you can go after. And also perhaps some governments that, that have the same thinking. It's a lot easier to go after alcohol perhaps than obesity and diet. Although I would argue that because I think it's very hard to eat healthy. You know, I, I work every day at it. It's, it's a real sacrifice to not eat all the things one, one has to eat. So I, again, I think this is just, you know, data for people to look at and you need to make your own decision. So again, different countries have different recommendations. And I think, you know, you need to look at where you live, what your government says, and then, you know, look at the data 
and make your own decision. And it's also important to note that uh, certain people of Asian descent have uh, a gene that that does not allow the the you know the high metabolism of alcohol. So the alcohol will accumulate more, and and people with that gene, you know, turn red. Should be very careful because the the alcohol could be more toxic because it's not metabolized easily. Quickly, bring me a beaker of wine so that I might wet my mind and say something clever. I really feel like that some, sometimes, like Aristophanes, my favorite Greek uh, poet. So alcohol in moderation in France is actually about a bottle and a quarter per week for both men and women. That's, you know, less than in the U.S. where it's, you know, up to, you know, probably two bottles per week. I actually like the, the French guidelines. I think, you know, no more than two drinks per day. If on one day you have half a bottle, I, I like to have a half a bottle dinner with my husband. And um, once a week, then I usually don't drink for a couple of days. Uh, and then I might have a glass here or there. So I think that's, you know, a good um, strategy. You know, one day you can drink a little more, but never on any day drink more than, than four glasses or preferably three. So I always say, you know, don't drink more than half a bottle in one day. And then if you do that, uh, skip a couple of days. And, and in general, it's good to skip a couple of days because that that reduces the, the craving. You know, you don't get used to every day, you know, having two glasses of wine. It's better not to do that, to really skip a couple of days. Um, it helps in, in the, the whole mental, uh, you know, the, the, the habit formation of having your, your drink every day. It's better not to create that habit. United Kingdom, it's a little higher than um, than France. And then there is a screening a test. Uh, I, I have here this gigantic glass. This is in front of me when I was younger um, with this gigantic glass. And I think you really need to look at the, 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 the container. You know, it's kind of like food. If you serve yourself a gigantic plate, you're probably gonna eat more. If you serve yourself on the gigantic glass, or you serve the, serve the full glass, you're going to drink more. So uh, I recommend, you know, putting a little mark on your glass or using small glasses. I think that's a really good method to drink less. And then, you know, feel comfortable, you know, running these questions by your family. I think, have you ever felt you should cut down on your drinking? I mean, most of my friends, they go on a trip, they come back, they say, I need to drink less, I need to eat less. You know, that's okay. But if you, if, the, if you have that, that um, you know, that answer, then, you know, yeah, take a week off, you know, um, when you take a whole month off, your your enzymes that metabolize the alcohol, um, you know, kind of uh, get uh, lowered. So then, when you start drinking again, you need to be careful. Um, but you know that's okay. Um, you should at no point be drinking too much. And answer these questions, and then decide what you want to do with it. Genetic factors are really important. Um, you know, half of alcohol risk is genetically de determined. Um, you have four times the risk of problem drinking if you have an alcoholic parent. So, you know, that's a really important decision uh, for young people. Also, early drinking increases the risk of alcohol uh, problems in an adult. Uh, there's tools. Um, a lot of people can just, you know, think about it, read some articles and cut down on the drinking. Uh, you can ask your doctor for help. Uh, there's a drug called naltrexone that can actually help people to drink less. You know, you take it, then you have a drink and you're not gonna to wanna to drink more. So I would definitely ask your doctor for some recommendations if you think that you're drinking too much. Mediterranean diet, again, it's extremely effective at uh, reducing inflammation, which is the source of much of the risk for um, cancer, for cardiovascular disease. Um, I always recommend one water, uh, one glass of water for one glass of wine. This is my dad's tip, and I think it's fantastic. Always drink with meals because then the level doesn't go up as much. Enjoy the flavors, drink slowly, and you know, exercise. You know, try to be really healthy. We all know know this. You know, eat less processed foods. Uh, take your time cooking uh, and use a small container. I think that's a really good tip for both uh, alcohol, uh, wine, and food. Um, I love this quote. Um, I'm going to skip through the study, but it's basically a study out of Harvard that um, showed uh, decreased activity in the amygdala um, that uh, if your amygdala is very activated, you can have an increase in the risk of heart attacks. And they found that people who drank even after they hadn't drank for a couple of days, had this reduction in the activity of the amygdala. And that might explain some of the cardiovascular benefits. So adding to the HDL increase and to the blood thinner effect, maybe there is an effect on uh, stress 
uh, from drinking in limited fashion in moderation. And I thought this was super interesting. You can uh, look up the article by Ahmed Tawakko. Uh, so this, I want to talk about this because I'm concerned that there has been this advisory by the WHO that some journalists are using to say that the cardiovascular benefits in moderate drinking are not there, um, but we're using the same studies to look at cancer. And they're saying that many uh, of the studies were done by scientists who have received financial support from groups funded by the alcohol industry, which, you know, when I read this, I was definitely concerned. Then I went to the Guide for Journalists, which I think is where this information is coming from. I'm not sure. And it says that many of the studies were funded by the alcohol industry. And there's this little reference too. So I went to the reference, which actually showed that in 386 observational studies, 21 studies, so 5.4 were funded by the alcohol industry. And actually, here, I'm gonna move this myself from here. And actually they found that the results were the same, whether the, the study was funded by the alcohol industry or not. So um, the uh, outcomes were, did not seem to be related to the funding source. So basically they showed the opposite, that yes, there is a small amount of studies, not many, you know, 5.4%. And actually they showed the same results. So uh, it's, it's, it, it's rather odd to me that this advisory says that studies have been funded by the alcohol industry and they referred to a study, uh, you know, to, to an actual study of this that says that they did not see any bias. So I thought that was interesting. So let's go back to this statement, right? Now we're questioning this. Um, this is another uh, article by this uh, same uh, reporter that um, talks about uh, this uh, professor, Dr. Ken Mukama, who I actually managed to speak to, to ask him, you know, have you gotten any funding? Um, he's, he's a very open book guy, like, you know, um, he's a great researcher. He's one of the authorities on alcohol um, and health. He, uh, you know, he talks about all this data I've talked about. He agrees that it's a nuanced answer to whether, you know, drinking is good or bad for you. And he also doesn't drink very much. Uh, and he's never taken anything from the alcohol industry. However, when uh, he and other researchers were uh, applying to the NIH for funding to do this randomized controlled study that would have been amazing if it had been done, the NIH, the National Institute of Health, which is a government organization, asked them to go talk to the alcohol industry to convince them to fund this study, which, you know, most of the studies, I mean, all the studies on, on drugs get funded uh, through an outside agency by the producer of that medication, because otherwise there would be no funding for these studies. I, I think a lot of people don't actually know that this is how the funding happens. But again, so this professor had just gone to talk to the alcohol industry on the bequest of the NIH. And then now he appears in the in the in the New York Times as this horrible person that is taking money from the alcohol industry, which I think is extremely unfair because the last thing we want to do is shut up the people who are trying to do the research and who are serious about this research. And we need an answer to this question, right? And just to for you to know that this is a big you know, uh, study that the NIH uh, paid for on, on these uh, medications that are really important cancer immunotherapy, uh, the NIH funded the study with money from the uh, drug, the pharmaceutical industry. So this happens all the time. Uh, this is the FDA that actually half of the, the, the funding, uh, you know, the funding for the FDA that approves uh, medications and other things comes from the producers of uh, the medications of the drugs themselves, but there's this whole mechanism there to, uh, you know, avoid any kind of influence and, you know, to have a real uh, scientific, uh, you know, uh, non-influence from uh, the manufacturer. And so this, this is something that's done all the time. And I don't, I, as a person, I, I wouldn't have objected to the alcohol industry funding some of this study, as long as they had nothing to do with, you know, the results. And actually the Dr. Mukamal told me, I, he's like, I told the alcohol industry people who were there that if the result was bad for alcohol, I was going to publish it in the New England Journal because everybody was going to want to know the results. So what can we do? Support research, randomized controlled study. If this could be done, it'd be amazing. Follow the guidelines, skip a few days per week, drink slowly with meals and company of friends and no binge drink it. Uh, that's important. Limited volume, high quality is my recommendation. Next slide is uh, my social media handle. And um, 
guess we're ready for questions now, and I'm going to come in to the talk. Muchas gracias.